Hank. So happy Wednesday. Um, and we're about to finally finish this 2000 slide uh, Google slide presentation that Ms. Young put together for you. And this I love that you downloaded it because I think it is actually 108 slides long. <laughs> it is pretty long. Um, but we've been talking about some pretty intense stuff, gender bias, and we're going to wrap that one up and then we're going to throw a little depression at you and then we're not like actual depression like we're not gonna like make you depressed we hope <laughs> we'll talk about a study about depression and then right. we're gonna then we'll finally be done and then you could be happy um, yes yeah, then so we'll be celebrate because we'll be done with this unit okay yeah okay so let's do it All so right. we've got a couple of learning objectives this time same concept we're pushing on with the experimental design this time we're going to be looking at different designs, like different experimental designs and different experimental methods, and why we might choose that particular experimental design. Okay. okay. So really quick, long, essential knowledge. And we're going to go through this slowly, but what we've been focused on at first is a completely randomized design. Remember we take our sample, we put it in a hat, we shake our hat up, and then we pull out random. Yeah, and that's right. Fine. Yeah. So that has been our completely randomized design. And right. that tends to balance effects of uncontrolled variables, which we called uh, confounding variables. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we, what do we do? We, oh, we did. We talked about, well, we actually didn't talk about a random number generator. We talked about like writing them on slips of paper and putting them in hats, but we very easily could also do this via random number generator. In fact, oftentimes that's the, what I write is a random number generator, but yeah, all the things. The next thing we're going to talk about is single blind and double blind experiments too. And um, that is kind of a, um, that's, Sometimes if people know they're being experimented on, they behave differently. So when they have a single blind experiment, like if I were going to teach two different math classes and I called and we called one, you know, the superstars class and the other ones, the dummies or the dumb birds, um, and you guys knew those names, you would behave accordingly. We don't do that. So the, you don't know which class you're in. Right. Um, that's when the participants don't know what they're in. And then the double blind is if I am part of the experiment as the teacher, I don't know who's which either. So sometimes if the experimenter knows that, then I, as the experimenter, will treat you differently. And that actually does happen a lot in education where the, the secondary, where the teacher and the students are both being experimented on and neither one knows which is which. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think we're guilty uh, as teachers of, of doing this, right? Like we get an honors group of students and we assume your background knowledge is this mm -hmm. and we teach to this. Um, when, uh, when we get an on-level class, we assume your background knowledge is this. And that's maybe a little bit different, but I think we do treat, you know, AP students different mm -hmm. than we treat on level students and we probably shouldn't it should be specific curriculum that's different and not how we treat those students so that's i'm just reflecting on my own self and my own bias that i put in them into teaching right i mean it is very important in medical experiments as well i mean yeah it really comes into play a lot in medical and certainly with what all the testing that they're doing now i would hope that it's probably double blind so that the doctors and the patients don't know. So there's right. no outside influence. Right. Um, we, I think we've already mentioned, I, I know I have mentioned control group. Um, the control group is a group that we leave alone that we don't do the treatment to. So we have some baseline to compare to. Um, and they get what's called a placebo. They get a fake pill something, or they get a treatment that's not actually the treatment. So they think they're getting something like so i give you a shot of just vitamin c or just a shot that does nothing for you and somebody else gets the actual test vaccine so these all these people who are getting trials of the covid vaccines right now about half of them are getting nothing and they think they're getting the vaccine which is kind of maybe well cool, but they, know, they know it's chance right yeah, they know they have a chance of getting yeah, it. yeah. but sometimes if I give you what we call the placebo or the fake, 
you think you actually got it and you actually act differently and behave differently. Um, and there has been a, actually a lot of studies about that. It's called the placebo effect where if I, get, you know, we'll talk about maybe when we get to the depression, if I give you a pill for, to treat depression and you think the pill gives you, it helps you with it, suddenly you feel better, okay? Even though it really didn't do anything. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so when we start looking at our designs, we're gonna look at a block design and we're gonna look at a matched pairs design. And I'm not gonna go into these definitions right now because we're gonna talk about them in depth during for the studies, but it is important that you say it, what, read it, write it, say it, learn it. So it probably would behoove you to hit pause, make sure that you have these two designs on paper, okay? All right, a completely randomized design, which we call a simple random sample, is the simplest of all designs. I take my sample, I assign you all a number, I pull your number out of a hat or from a random number generator and without replacement, and we go from there. That is your completely random or simple random sample design. Okay, your completely randomized design. And so that's kind of like, if we took our tier one and our tier two, and we just, told, we just completely randomly put them into the John Jennifer, okay? I could end up with a lot of variations of how this could have happened. Right. They're balanced so, there, but they may not have been, okay? Right, right. Um, and so what happens when I have that variation in random assignment is there's going to be overlap of what people think and feel and whatever. And there's gonna be this, these people that there's no overlap. And that's because there are big differences due to chance alone, okay? What, when we have a problem is when there's not a ton of overlap. That's when we start thinking, okay, well, maybe we have an issue here, we need to do a better job. So how are we gonna reduce the variability due to school tier. And this is what Mr. Bobby was talking about in our last video, where he was saying like, oh, okay, well, let's take our two groups and let's make sure we split them evenly. And that's called randomized uh, block design. I'm sorry, block design. Yeah. Where we make subcategories and then randomly design, divide within those subcategories, but they call them blocks in statistics. Right. Right. Um, a lot of times this will be like males and females, or it'll be age groups or something like that. Okay. Be like at the high school, we would want to survey sophomores, juniors, and seniors separately because you all would each have different opinions about certain things. We wouldn't right. want to survey all of the sophomores about activities to have um, for a senior. And that could potentially happen. I mean, it's not, it's not likely, but it could potentially happen if we did an SRS. Right. So then we want to if we want to make sure we get a certain number of each group, then we can group them and pull randomly from each group. You would have called this a stratified sample um, before when we were doing observational studies. OK, now that we're doing experimental, this is called a block design. This design reduces variation between treatment groups at the start of the experiment makes it easier to show that differences in responses are due to the treatment rather than chance, okay? Rather than chance. So here, we're gonna describe a block. So we're gonna block the science lab faculty members by university tier. In each block, we're gonna assign each faculty member a number one through six. So we put them into blocks, tier one and tier two. Each one gets a one through six. We write down uh, identical, uh, excuse me, write numbers down on identical slips of paper, draw them out of a hat for three without replacement, John Jennifer groupings, so on and so forth. Here we go. Three to John, three to Jennifer, random from the tier. Not from the whole group, but from the tier. So those three for John and three Jennifer have something in common or something we think is important that we're eliminating that behavior or that trait from the experiment by grouping or blocking them. Yeah. Then we do it again for tier two. 
Here we go. And so what are we gonna do now? Okay, well, we're gonna take the two groups, compare, take the two groups, compare for tier one and tier two. And then we're gonna combine their results after accounting for the average difference in each block, okay? And all of the math that's happening, we're gonna talk a lot about the math later. later. Don't worry about that, just get the philosophy right now. Right, so understand. And when we assigned it earlier in this presentation, they were assigned randomly just by chance, but it could have been, we might've had, you know, um, we not have had balance between the groups and that's what we want. We want yeah. the balance between the groups. Forcing the balance, forcing the balance. Okay, so we're gonna switch now from feminism. <laughs> I'm not feminism, but whatever. Quality, or quality to mental health. Yes, from equality to mental health, yeah. And we're gonna look at a study that dealt with depression. So it's depression it's arises from a comp, what? This isn't a presidential debate. We aren't going to yell at each other. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> wow, this is not appropriate. <laughs> We're on video. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Or it's the day after the first presidential debate, and we were, yeah. we were just laughing at it, so. All right. anyway. This is why we're talking about depression today. All right, yeah. so depression arises from a complex interaction of biological, uh, psychological, and social factors. Knowing which factor is most influential could potentially help the treatment. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that. Okay, so can we design an experiment that isolates which factor is the most prominent cause of depression? Biological, psychological, or social? Well, I have three different things I need to test, so I kind of want to look at, I want to break them apart as best I can, right? Right. So this becomes super difficult to control for variation because people have different levels of depression, different types of symptoms, an array of biochemical, uh, psychological, and environmental conditions, and then also potential side effects from whatever treatment we decide on. But all of these things that could cause variation in our data. So how are we gonna really narrow our focus? Remember in our last one, we were able to just say, here are two pieces of paper, the exact same resume, just John and, and, and Jennifer, that's the only thing that's different. So how can we weed through all this stuff? Is it possible? Okay, so we begin to think about, is it possible? And the first thing we need to do is we need to think, okay, we need a control group. Who would be the control group if we started thinking about um, testing a group of people for medicine for depression? And the answer isn't what you think it is. It's not like this group of people and this group of people. The yeah. control group becomes themselves. Where they are right now at the beginning, right? So this is called a matched pairs design. A matched pairs design is when you're going to compare somebody to themselves. Okay. Imagine I want to know if you can throw further with your dominant hand. Comparing Mr. Bobby and I's throwing to our, with our dominant hand wouldn't necessarily tell us a lot. But if I throw with my non dominant hand and then I throw with my dominant hand, I'm my own control. You have two people, you're providing two pieces of data. Right. So they're going to get some kind of rating or some kind of measurement before the experiment and then treatment and then after. You're looking right. for the change right. in that one person in this yeah. case. So if you're comparing people to themselves, that's called matched pairs. Not the only kind of matched pairs, by the way, just one kind of matched pair. You can also match any similarity. If I were to find another 38 year old school teacher, female, with my similar characteristics, I could compare us for in different aspects, right? So that would also be a matched pairs design. A matched pair design is a type of randomized block experiment in which each block is composed of two similar experiments, which we call a matched pair. Mm -hmm. Often the matched pair is simply the same experimental unit receiving both treatments. The order of the treatment should be randomized though. 
Did I just get too statsy? Do you want to clarify what I said, or do you feel like it's clear? okay? I mean, it's just that they're they have some. I mean, often the pairs have a trait in common. Like Miss Young and I would not make a matched pair, even though we always wear the same color shirt. Um, we're different genders. We're different ages. Uh, I'm better looking. I have more shoes. Okay. That last um, one's true. That is true. Okay. But if we, if I found somebody who had similar traits to me, then I, that would be my partner. It doesn't have to be a before and after kind of thing, but it could be. Okay. But if I, if there was two similar people and if, there, if we're looking at voting records or something, you know, somebody who had a similar belief as me, we would sit down and, and watch the debate and have different, you know, would they have a different opinion on after watching the debate? Somebody right. who had the same political meaning, same background as me, and then we would watch two different debates or two different commercials and see if that had an impact on us. Okay, yeah. to talk politics, since we're talking politics anyway, too. So. I wasn't talking politics, by the way. Yeah, but I brought it up earlier, so I... <laughs> but that's actually very, very relevant uh, to anybody who's interested in... If you're interested in... Um, politics or going into government. And I know that I've had several students from Lakeside do that in the past. Um, you know, they have to understand statistics to understand politics. I agree. I agree. An important thing on this slide before we move on is that if the experimenter, experimentee, excuse me, is receiving both treatments, then the order has to be randomized. So if I were doing an experiment on dominant versus non-dominant hand, I would want to like say heads is my dominant hand and flip a coin to decide which hand am I going to throw with first dominant or non-dominant. And every person in the experiment would do, the, do a similar thing. So then right. if Mr. Bobby were going next, he would flip the coin. So it's not like right. the coin so flip is going to decide everybody's. Right. Because you'd want, you don't, you don't want it to be like, oh, maybe they were just tired. And that's why they didn't throw as far with their dominant hand if you started with non-dominant or something like that. Wait, I, I can't throw up my left hand. <laughs> You're right, Henry. You're not a lefty, right? Correct. I'm not a lefty. My daughter is a lefty, though. Okay, so... Uh, in right, so here's the depression study. Yes. In 2015, there was a depression study in the Journal of American Medical Association. Uh, this is from Skew the Script as well. Normally, I put that little icon at the bottom right-hand corner, and I just realized that that's not there, so I apologize. Um, this lesson describes a simplified version of this depression study, but of course you can always come to this slide and click and it will be available to you. Okay, so the question, overarching question is, um, depression, is it all in your head? Researchers wanted to test if taking a fake pill would actually alleviate depression symptoms, even though the pill had no active ingredients. 35 people enrolled in the study, which is an important number, by the way, uh, which we'll talk about later, and all had major depression, major depression, I'm sure they defined that in the paper, and none were taking any medications for their depression. Okay, so describe a matched pairs design if I've got 35 subjects. For each subject, flip a coin. Heads indicates they get the fake pill for the first week, no pill for the second week. Tail indicates the opposite treatment. Okay, so we're going to take a pill for a week, see if it helps. Take a pill for not a week, see if, it, you know, that kind of thing. And we're going to see if there's a difference between the two weeks. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You good, Mr. Bobby? You good. Oh, all right. Okay. I was just hearing your dog in the background. I know, walking around being annoying. Can you hear that my people talking? Because they're annoying me. Have each subject fill right, out okay. a depression questionnaire and undergo a PET brain scan at the end of each week. Compare the measurement for each subject and compile the results. Interestingly enough, my husband did brain research for seven years. He would actually sit next to the person in the scanner and ask them questions while another person sat behind the screen to look at which parts of their brains would light up during the questions. It was cool. Mr. Robbie, Go back, I think that second. Was Go back one second. I just, you missed, uh, there's one thing I want to point out. Notice that uh, the, they would get the pill either the first week or the second week. That uh, was random, the mixed up there. 
So they would be, that's, that, that assignment was made there and they're gonna compare their survey results, I'm assuming at the end, so. Yeah. Okay, experiment, eth uh, experiment ethics. All subjects were given real depression treatments after the two week phase of the study. When living subjects are involved, researchers must make their studies ethical. And this is a huge, huge, huge thing. And this is literally, what, one sentence, two sentences? There are entire courses in undergraduate and graduate work that deal with nothing but experimental ethics, okay? So important to understand that you never want something to be detrimental to, to a patient. Uh, there's a big debate right now about what Mr. Bobby was talking about with the people who are getting uh, COVID treatment, because if at any time during that research study, an actual cure for COVID mm -hmm. is created, technically, the study that are going on right now oh, will die. You're breaking up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Am I, I, I good you're now? okay. Keep going. Okay, so technically the people that are receiving all those experimental treatments, they have to get the one that works. That's, that's the ethical thing to happen. But the, that means the millions of dollars that are being spent on the experiments right now, like it, it all goes to pot. So it's an interesting conundrum. Okay. Sorry, I was a little choppy right there for a while. Keep going. I think my internet was acting funny. Oh, okay. So, I depression study. Happened. Do what? Keep going. I, I missed the, some of what you said there, but I, it sounded beautiful what I did here. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Okay, depression study results. On average, participants respond, uh, reported less severe depressive symptoms after their week with the fake pill. Maybe depression is all in their head. On average, participants showed increased, what's this symbol mean again? That's mu, that's mean. Mm -hmm. Mean opioid receptor brain activity in regions of the brain associated with emotion and stress regulation. So this is just like the sciencey way to say that like, not only do they think it, but they actually had brain activity that caused the change in their yeah in their behavior and their attitude or their depression yeah okay. nothing I mean it it was their brain believing they were being treated caused a change it caused the treatment right it's it's a physical reaction. This isn't somebody saying like, I'm taking pills, I feel better. Like they actually do feel better. Like they do, their brain science says they feel better from a fake pill. Hmm. Power of positivity. <laughs> so the belief in the pill caused a biochemical change, okay? Fake pills have also shown significant benefits for migraines, blood pressure, asthma, arthritis, and a whole other host of physical illnesses, okay? This is called placebo effect. Placebo effect means there's an actual physiological change based on a belief that something is making you better. Whoa. For both physical and mental illnesses, it's often hard to distinguish between the mental and physical phenomena. And that's why it, people are so hard to work with when they have anxiety, when they have depression, when they have, um, and that's why people who don't have a mental illness, there are a lot of people who have a hard time believing it's real mm -hmm. because, because it's hard to pinpoint. And they will test the, I mean, they do act, test actual drugs uh, against placebos and they see improvements in both groups. But oftentimes the improvement with the placebo group is like this and the, the improvement in the group with the actual pill is like this. Yes. So that's how they know that the pill's actually doing anything. 
Yes. Um, but usually when they're testing medicine, they do have to, because if they're testing a pill, they have to give the pill to you. And yeah. you don't know that you're getting the real pill or the placebo. And both groups often will show improvement. It's the degree to which the actual pill makes further improvement. Um, they're showing improvements in their depression, but they're probably still depressed. They're just probably not as depressed. Right. Versus the actual medication, which would actually treat and significantly improve. Yeah. The, it will treat. Don't, don't want to say that depression is not real because neither of us believe that. No, definitely not. The, the actual medicine creates a chemical, excuse me, doesn't create. The actual medicine goes to treat a chemical imbalance in your brain. That right. is a very real thing. Yes. Okay. It's just this concept of um, even, you know, even a, and a fake pill for, for a multitude of reasons, we just happen to pick depression, can, yeah. uh, can begin to convince you physiologically that you're feeling better. Okay. And that's what makes that's what makes research and ultimately statistics so hard too, because yes. people are messy. And that's maybe partly why I just thought of this. Maybe that's partly why they do some trials on animals first, because yeah. sure. they're a little more easy to work with than yeah. us. We're kind of muddy. Uh-huh. I'm a definitely muddy person. Yeah. So placebo is an inactive treatment, like a sugar pill or salt water, IV drip or something like that. Placebo effect is when a subject's belief of receiving an inactive, or excuse me, of receiving an active treatment leads to a measured response, even though the treatment is actually inactive. So that's the difference between the two. Yep. Okay. We also talk about blinding, and Mr. Bobby already talked about this a little bit. In a single blind study, either the subject or the researcher are unaware of who receives an active treatment. Okay. So in that case of the depression study, the uh, subject was blinded because they didn't know which pill they were getting, okay? Now, if the subject and the researchers both did not know who was getting the pill, that would be called a double blind study because both the subject and the researcher would be unaware of who was receiving the active treatment or the placebo. Why do we blind subjects? We try to prevent placebo effect. Mm -hmm. That's why. Why do we blind researchers? To prevent that confounding, that my attitude as the researcher may give you a clue, and my tri my treatment, my behavior towards you might give you a right. uh, a clue. Yeah, I could say something. I could like there's a there's potential there for muddying the water when the researcher knows what's you know who's getting what because their facial expression could give it away there are a million things that could give it away so if both were blind to who was getting what then there's no potential for muddying the water so researchers are trying to prove that a treatment works and they may end up favoring the treatment group. And this is what I was talking about um, in their facial expression and just the, their manner of being, um, there could be something there that would muddy the water. So that's it, that's all. Now, this is the last one. Some of you are probably watching this the day of the test because you didn't do what you were supposed to do, <laughs> but uh, I hope it was helpful and good luck. And we will see you on the next one in Unifor. Uh Bye. All right, for three happy days. <laughs>